There's no time. us again and it's episode 114 only one more episode until the halloween episode yeah that's gonna be a pretty good episode we got shauna coming over again yeah shauna and eric are coming over i'm gonna Um, make eric talk too (laughs) last time he didn't talk people were like man who's that dude in the back what's he doing i'm gonna make that motherfucker talk yeah and we and we have like a shit ton of stories that uh really cool stories that people sent in uh we have all kind of fun stuff we're gonna do actually somebody had a good suggestion one of our listeners said, hey, why don't you guys play your card game that you invented, like, on the show, my Crimson Drop on a Crystal Palette uh, card game. And I was like, hmm, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, they're coming over tomorrow, and we're going to, like, try and record, you know, pieces of it all day and then kind of edit together the best stuff. So we'll see how it goes. If we if we get into that, we might get into I, that. I think it would probably take a long time, and it would be a lot of editing. How long would it take to play a game? Um, it depends on how quickly people can figure out the murder. Yeah. So, you know, just depends on how good your investigation skills are. <laughs> Not quite an answer. About how long does it take to, to play a game, do you think? About an hour? What did I just say? It depends. It depends? Okay. It's like, you know, it's like Clue. It's, it, how good is your right. deductive, deductive I never reasoning? Clue. I never played If Clue. your deductive reasoning is really good, then it won't take very this long. It's going to sound crazy. I think I've only played a board game maybe two or three times. What kind of childhood did you have? Man? I didn't play that. Did you like grow up on the moon or I didn't play a rock that. or something? No, I think I played Monopoly once and I never I didn't even get through the game. I used to no, I, I don't really like I like board games. There was this one we used to have called Parcheesi. Yeah, I played that. Played it when I was a kid, yeah. Yeah. I I fucking I love board you games. You know, checkers man. and shit. It's like Mystery Mansion, yeah. I just like all that kind of shit. I've never played anything like what you made there. Or clue. So I don't I don't know anything about it. I don't I mean I don't know if it's a three hour game or a four hour game or half hour I have never played a game of Clue that was three hours that's for sure (laughs) there's only so many solutions to the mystery you know what I mean so it's not gonna like it's to turn that into a show we'd have to learn how to edit we'd have to we'd have to edit it the right way well yeah but that's why they have like the funny that well yeah that's why we're that's why I'm doing it ahead of time but like I said we'll see how it goes it's just you know you know how we do we never like fucking plan anything yeah. Uh, so we just kind of go with the flow of whatever is happening at yeah. the time and then just kind of hope for the best. Yeah. But it seems to be serving us well so far. I kind of thinking, though, to do that, we'd probably need a cameraman. Yeah, perhaps. All right. Yeah. So I don't know. But yeah, we'll see. Well, like I said, right. we'll see how it goes because we're going to start recording the Halloween show tomorrow. So other than that, like I said, it's we're recording this on Friday night. We got our drinks. Yeah. We got all our stuff, you know. Yeah, it's serial uh, killers tonight, right? It is. We're going back to true crime. Uh, the both of these have been uh, requested by various listeners, so I decided to do a whole European true crime type of thing. Uh, first part of the show, we're going to be talking about the infamous monster of Florence, and right. then the second half of the show, we're going to be talking about the vampire of Hanover, I've otherwise never heard known of as one. German serial killer Fritz right. Harman. Um, I also have a news story this time around because one of our listeners sent us a. Uh, sent us a news story about a new trial of like a British killer, okay. uh, and they're retrying him. So I'm just gonna like talk about that. All right, but before you get news, to the news, news though, we got, before we get to the news though, got to mention the audio book. It's been slowed down a little bit because you had such a huge workload of yes. graphic design. Yes, it's totally recorded. Jenny just has to get through there and edit it, and then send it up to him. Really, we're hoping maybe another week, huh? Yeah, I mean, I was hoping, I was shooting for getting it done this week, but then, as sometimes happens, um, I ended up getting several very large graphic design jobs from several different clients, pretty much on the same day. Couldn't walk away from that much. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I got really backed up with the, with the audio recording and stuff like that. Bunch of packages and stuff she's got to make. Yeah, so most of that is out of the way now, so I'm kind of hoping that, you know, as next week comes along... Uh, I can get back to editing. Like I said, it's all recorded. I just have to like go through and take out all my fuck ups. Yeah, coughs and ums and <laughs> burping hold on. and whatnot. Right. <laughs> or where I Her like yelling at me when I make too much noise in the yeah, kitchen. Yeah, I was like, shut up! What are yeah, you doing? Yeah. I told you I was recording. <laughs> 
well, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that, there's a lot of people waiting on that, and I know that you know we're we're trying to get it get it out to you as soon as possible. You yeah. Know, once it goes on the market, what's this cat doing? No, I don't oh my have goodness, time for Beijing. That. I don't have time for you, kid. <laughs> damn. I don't have time for that. She really wants to get. Show. She wants to get brushed. Okay, brush her. Yeah, she wants to get brushed. Um. What else is going on? Well, let's see. Um, check out our last movie review, which was The Evil Dead. Yeah. Um, also, check out, this is going to go up on Tuesday, right? So, our second episode of our 13 o'clock matinee show will be out, on which we watched, what the hell did we watch? Uh, First Man, we watched yeah. uh, Bad Times at the El Royale, and we watched Christopher Robin. So, yeah. uh, check that out if you haven't already. Mediocre um, week for uh, movies, if you ask yeah, me. Yeah, well, you know, I really liked First Man. Actually, I, actually, I liked all the movies this week, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was me grumbling about it. You're always grumbling grum about something. He's like a grouchy Christopher old Robin man. was okay. He's like a grouchy old man. I didn't man. like the other He's one. not even old, but yeah, he's, not like even a, old, he's, he's like a grouchy old man. <laughs> it's, becoming, it's becoming taxing to watch all these movies for these people. It's becoming oh, like a you job, poor, man. You poor baby. Gotta go to the theater. Listen three to these times first world God problems. Damn. Listen to these first world taking, problems. Taking time out of my motorcycle riding. Oh, you it's so hot though. I don't, it's not really. You don't like to ride it, motorcycles in the summer, it's anyways. Too it's too fucking hot. hot. It's, it's Florida, hot. man. It's Terrible. like you can't really go outside in the True. summer in Florida. It's... You're just you're like a turtle in your shell, just waiting for it to blow. Yeah, over. you're just like when when is it sure. not going to be four thousand degrees outside? Saw a Starry Night Live, really good show last weekend. Yes, last we did. Weekend. Well, actually, it'll be the weekend before last. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, <laughs> after the show, uh, we went to the hotel with them. It well, them we were supposed and... to be going to an after party. Yeah. We actually we never... all went to the hotel. It was me, you, two other goth girls. One's name was Shannon. Yeah, I don't know what the other one's name was. Yeah, she was the girl who did the uh, art cover yeah. art for the, for the. I forgot her name. I knew it, but I forgot it. And then Michael was there. It's so funny because um, they have to have get separate rooms. Well, only yeah, because Howard snores so much. Only Howard he? gets his own room. Ain't that something? <laughs> He gets his own room. Because we didn't know. We thought we were just yeah, going we're back like, to the hotel. So Howard? we were going to drop off Howard. And it was like, well, where'd he go? Yeah. They said yeah, he and Michael, Michael was playing all these bitch games with me, man. It was fucking funny. Because when you look at Michael, you know what I mean? He's kind of like this, kind of has like an effeminate appearance to him. You know, kind of like a kind of like a real skinny Robert Smith and the way he acts and everything. But he, the dude's all man. <laughs> so what he tries to do is he tries to like get into these pissing matches with me in front of girls. All right. <laughs> They're hilarious. He's coming up to me trying to out testosterone me. Okay. <laughs> With these girls. He's got this. I don't, sometimes there's a man. Sometimes a man tries to come up next to me and be more of a man than me. But the testosterone thing doesn't really kind of work out. The, the difference. When he stands next to me, the only kind of man he could ever be would be like a whoa man. I look back there and go, whoa, man. What are you packing? It's that little back. I, I don't, I'm not. I'm not gonna talk about his butt. <laughs> you just did. <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about his butt. I don't want to make him feel because he might be listening. I don't want to make him feel too effeminate. All right. So he comes up talking smack to me, and he's got a telephone receiver. Just the receiver. Just and the, the cord. receiver, like an and, old fashioned one. Yeah, like and like it's the bright kind, blue. And it's bright blue, and it's on a cord that goes into his. Cell phone. I'm assuming, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. That way he could pretend like he's talking on the phone while he's talking on the phone. phone. I've never seen any shit like that. <laughs> phone inception. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he well, talks so... on the phone like a 16-year-old girl. And he starts fucking with me with this damn phone. And I, I take the phone from him. <laughs> I take the receiver from him. And I start talking to somebody. We were pretty low. I'm, I'm talking. We drank a lot. Yeah, night. we drank a lot. <laughs> I, I can't really explain it, but there was nobody on the other end. Well, it's just obviously. That, instead of <laughs> instead of fucking with him directly, I started fucking with him indirectly. As though you were talking. As to if I was else talking to somebody time. else about him. Yeah. It they, was very funny. Yeah, they thought it was. Funny. I wish I could remember exactly what you said because I was, I was like just laughing funny my ass off. Like, because. He was trying to outdo me. He's trying, you can't out kamikaze me. I'm I'm a true kamikaze. So I'm back there, and, you know. And Plus, I got he has to, no shame. No, no. <laughs> so I'm back there, and I'm going, yeah, I brought some, a whole tube of it, <laughs> just shit like that. Oh no, she's flirt. He's flirting with me. Oh, oh yeah, she's flirting with me. Just, and the the girls were laughing. You know, it was all. Michael loves that shit. Though. It's all punk games. They were so good. They were you know how when really you know how when you too. see two dogs, one two male dogs, and one of them trying to get on top of the other, and it goes no 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 no, and they keep they keep doing this. 
of whoever is in the dominant position. That's what he was trying to do with me. Okay. You know, <laughs> I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna let that happen. <laughs> I'm not going to let that happen. That was a very fun night, though, even though, like I said, well, the problem was that we, they asked us to get there early so we could hang out for like an hour before they went on yeah. stage. So we got, we got to this place at like seven o'clock and yeah. then we didn't get home until 4.30. Yeah. And that girl came <laughs> with us. Yeah. She, she got kicked out of the room. She wanted to sleep in the bathtub and he's just like, you can sleep in here. He's like, so we had to take her home. So we just, she had to sleep in our guest it room. It was in our guest room. Yeah. We made her a and, sandwich. And, and, she, and she was like. I have to be at yoga at 7 o'clock. or eight, 10 in the morning. 10 in the morning. I said, fuck that yoga. I'm not taking you there. She woke us up anyway. Yeah, woke me up anyway, man. <laughs> I felt something like spider fingers on me. <laughs> like that. I looked and whoa, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> Girl was in our room, you know what I mean? <laughs> and the clothes on, you know what I mean? She's like, hey, I got to go to, I got to go to um, yoga. Well, see, she says, lives far yoga. away. She lives in St. Pete, yeah. which is like, how fucking far is that? It's like 60 miles, 70 miles. I had to get up out of bed early and drive this. And she thing. needed a ride. You know where she was going to do people. yoga? She was going to do yoga in the cemetery. Yeah, in Greenwood Cemetery in Orlando. At a, at a place called Babyland, where all the dead babies were. That was like super cool. Yes, yeah, so I dropped I don't off think there. I've ever been in that cemetery before. Babyland. We were like driving around. I'm like, wow, this is really big. Some and weird then, shit, man. Yeah, and then we drive past and I'm like, Babyland. She's down, she's oh down my there going to do, do yoga in her goth outfit with her big old fat platform boots and shit. Babyland. Yeah. You gotta pop a photograph of her in there. She's a trip looking chick. I don't know. I'm not gonna do okay. that. I don't know her that well. We only just met her at the show. <laughs> she wanted to do the the um, Halloween show with us, but she can't. Yeah, make... she was actually gonna come over tomorrow yeah. to the Halloween show, but she can't come. But like I said, she lives kind of far away. Mm. But yeah, so uh, let's see yes, what else. That was our story. Yeah. Um, uh, as usual, if you would like to financially support the show, you can go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast. We have had uh, one new patron this week whose name is John. Hey there. Thank you very much. And also, one of our previous patrons, Sandra, has increased her support. Actually, doubled it. So that's yeah. uh, in this past week. So, all right. We're, you know, we're just plugging along yeah. uh, on the Patreon. And if you want to help us out, like I said, you can go to the Patreon page or you can go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. Yeah. There's a link at the sidebar to a PayPal account where you can give a one time donation if you would like to do so. Yeah, and check out a starry night. Yeah, you should. Really good band. I just plugged them, told a story about Mike. <laughs> they are hilarious, and they're really, really good. Michael writes all them lyrics too. Yeah. Yeah. They're really, yeah, and they're like I said, they're really nice. Guys. I didn't know. I didn't know he wrote them. Yeah. I didn't realize he was that talented. I'm gonna have to slap that bitch. You gonna slap the talent out of him? I'm gonna slap the talent out of him. I thought it was Howard writing those lyrics. <laughs> now all of a sudden, I got respect for him. Now I gotta go respect him now. Next time I oh, see him, that, ain't that something? I know. Michael, I'm happy to respect you, you, bitch. I know how you hate doing that. Fucking playing so many games with me, man. <laughs> playing those fucking punk games with me in front of those girls. Oh, come on. It was hilarious. Yeah. It's hilarious. He's trying to earn points off me. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He's well, jealous. You think? <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. That's how He's I'm going to spin hater. it. He's a hater. That's how I'm going to spin it. That's how I'm going to spin it. That bitch loves me, man. All right. Well, yeah. all right. So... Enough with these shenanigans. Yeah, let's get to the. I, I'll, you guys know what's going on. Yeah, I know. got tequila. You know what's going on. That's, I still, how, that's why it goes this way. I still need to do. I still need to do the tequila shirt. I just haven't had any time to do it. I have you make like, a badass tequila shirt. It's gonna have an Aztec sundial with two Aztec silhouettes of Aztec hottie chicks on either side, kind of like, kind of like our um. Our, vril shirt. Kind of like our Vril shirt. But it's going to be like a Mexican version of the Vril shirt. And yeah. it's going to have, you know, a, a piece of... It's going to have like a symbol for agave and then another symbol for, for, for pineapple and another symbol for guava. And that's the 33, 33, 33 or, or one part, one part, one part mix of this drink right here. That's The, the that's, Kugel Khan. That, the Kugel Khan. That's the name <laughs> of that drink. I call it the Kugel Khan. Cool, cool Khan. <laughs> <laughs> Straight out of from Apocalypto when they're up there on top of that as pyramids cutting those dudes' hearts out. That's what they were drinking. That's what the, yeah, this is what made that Citation happen. Citation needed. <laughs> what made that happen. All right, like I said, now I feel really bad because we just like went off on all this like silly shit. Now it's I have to good. talk about like bad murder. And now I have to talk about like murders and stuff. Well, we'll get into it. Just ease, ease them into it. I'm slowly. just trying to ease into it. Okay, so. Ease them into it, love. As I said on the last show, 
I'm kind of phasing out the news story thing, unless it's sort of related it's an to story. whatever okay. you know we're doing. Now, actually, somebody did send us uh, send me this um, a link to this uh, case. Okay. And since I was already doing European murders, I figured, well, I'll just throw this on the on the news story here. Now, this actually relates back to uh, a double murder that happened in Brighton, in England, back in October of 1986. There were two little girls named Karen Hathaway and Nicola Fellows, and they were um, they were like walking to their friend's house or walking home from school or something like that, and they disappeared. And then the next day, their bodies were found in the woods. They had been, um, they'd been like raped and murdered. They'd been out there all night. Yeah. So it was done out there, probably. Yeah. Okay. So the creepy thing about it is that um, they pretty much knew right away like who it was that did it because here's this guy named Russell Bishop, and he came out and he said, "Oh, well." Before they found the bodies, he said, "Oh, well, we'll help you look for them." Like, because it was like you know a bunch of people, locals came out and helped to look the police look for them. So he's like, "Oh, I have uh, my dogs, and if they smell the girls' clothes, maybe the dogs can find." the girls and all this other stuff. But then he started saying like all this weird kind of shifty stuff like, um, oh, I don't want to search anymore because if my dogs find them, then I'll get blamed and all this other kind of shit. So they were like, hmm. So eventually they did end up arresting him and he went on trial. However, he was acquitted in 1987. But then three years later in 1990, he was arrested once again for kidnapping raping and attempting to murder a seven-year-old girl damn so he was he couldn't in, just leave it alone right so he was put in jail again and the similarity between that crime and the original crime from 1986 led police to believe they're like okay well we need to re-examine all the because you know it was 86 87 that they had dna evidence but it was very you know very rudimentary it was very much in its infancy so they said we're gonna go back and reinvestigate uh, the murders of Karen Hathaway and Nicola Fellows, and because we're pretty sure it was him, but there just was insufficient evidence in 1987 to convict him. So evidently, they're doing that now. He is still he is on trial at this moment. So hopefully, if he did do it, which it kind of seems like he did, because there's other evidence too. It's not just like DNA evidence. Um, then hopefully, he will get uh, convicted for it. You know, much later than, I mean, he's like in his 50s now. He was 20 when the crime occurred. But it's kind of scary, though, because if he hadn't been, you know, if he hadn't been released, I mean, the the little girl that he attacked in 1990, who was seven, now she she lived. Uh, she didn't die. I mean, but, you know, it's she still had that shit happen to her. Um, but if he hadn't done that, then they might not have even thought to, like, retry him hmm. for these two girls. So this is like... Evidently, this is like one of the the longest running uh, inquiry, like in Sussex history or something like that. So, like I said, this is it's this is a real news story. It's re like really ongoing. The trial is still ongoing. Damn. So, uh, we'll just uh, see how that shit goes. So, but that's the news story somebody sent me that. So Russell Bishop, like I said, guy's name. No oh, perv. Pedophile, yeah. Yeah. And probable murderer. Well, oh, definitely oh, yeah, rape is probable he's murderer. Murder. Yeah, he's murdered. All right. So now let's get into the case known as the Monster of Florence. I've never heard of this one. Now, I actually, um, there is a book about this. And interestingly, uh, Thomas Harris, who wrote uh, Hannibal, Silence of the Lambs, all those, uh, you know, Hannibal Lecter books, he actually attended a trial of one of the... Uh, suspected murderers in this case and he was so fascinated by it that this was the reason that the book Hannibal was set in Florence because hmm. of this particular case so he got like a really interested in it there have been a couple of books about it like I said now the confusing thing about it is that even though it's known as the monster of Florence which would seem to imply that it's one killer um, authorities are pretty sure that it's more than one and that maybe it's like an organized gang. Some of them might be in prison at the moment. Some of them might be dead. Uh, they're not real sure. They kind of know who some of them are, but they don't know how many perpetrators uh, are involved. So this might be a ring of killers. Yeah, that's what they're right. suspecting. And they're suspecting it might be a cult type thing because okay. some of the murders were kind of ritualistic. 
All right. Well, lay it on us. Tell us how it went down. So the Monster of Florence case generally refers to a series of eight double murders that took place in and around uh, Florence, Italy between 1968 and 1985. Okay. So they're pretty old. Yeah. All right. Um, and some of them they didn't know until later, like right. were related. Um, similar to killers like the Zodiac, Phantom Killer, stuff like that, uh, generally couples in cars uh, were targeted. All right. Now, interestingly, in Italy at the time, uh, maybe still now, I'm not really sure, but since a lot of Ita like young Italian people lived with their parents until they were married, so sometimes they would live in their parental home until they were like in their mid-20s, um, car sex is a big thing. You know what I mean? So like, you know, cause they, you know, they still live at home. So they go out and have sex in cars and parks and stuff like that. So it's, it's probably a much bigger thing than it is here. So, um, but that's who the killer is targeting. Like I said, much like the Zodiac. So they think at this point that there are at least four perpetrators, maybe more. Weirdly, they're called, they're either called the Snacks Companions or the Picnic Companions. What? I'm not real sure okay. why they call them that. Um, they generally struck uh, when it was a new moon, uh, so it was darker outside, I'm guessing. I don't, I don't know if that was like a ritualistic component to the crime or if they just did it because it was darker outside and it'd be harder to see them. Uh, usually used a 22 caliber Beretta pistol. Almost all of them had that uh, aspect. Um, also usually did, um, mutilations with knives. Didn't usually do anything to the men, but the female victims almost always had, um, some of them also had breasts removed. Damn. So, were they raped? No. Were they, I guess they weren't. No, either. They weren't raped, no. They weren't raped? Okay. Not that they know of. Not that they know of. All right. Um, but, you know. So... That's some weird shit. Yeah, it's pretty weird. And like I said, that's one of the reasons why they think this is kind of like a ritualistic sort of uh, yeah. group of people. Like, not, not necessarily a satanic cult, but something like that, like some kind of a cult group or something. Yeah. So the first murders that are, you know, that fall under the Monster of Florence umbrella. This is a woman, she's 32 years old. Her name is Barbara Lochi. Now, she's a married woman, but she's well known around town for being promiscuous let's say was she a hooker no okay um she just liked sex and okay didn't and just kind of ran Being around well known around town for promiscuity in my mind just means hooker to me that, well, i thought that's usually a well, euphemism she didn't get paid for okay. it okay that i know of all right that's just a sporting girl yeah yeah <laughs> like i said so uh so it's barbara Lochi and her one of her lovers at the time was named antonio lo bianco um she was known as queen b around the city and oh. had several lovers going at once. So evidently it's August 21st, 1968 and Barbara and Antonio, uh, as well as Barbara's little kid, he, he, you know, she had a little kid. Uh, they all went to the movies. Now on the way home from the movies, the kid falls asleep in the back seat of the car. So Antonio says, Hey, let's pull over in the cemetery and we'll, you know, you, I can show you my etchings. <laughs> Right? Okay. So they're having sex in the car in the cemetery. And then, so this guy comes out of the darkness in the cemetery and starts shooting them. Then the killer takes the kid, picks him up, and, like, spirits him out of the car. How old is the kid? Um, I'm actually not sure. He was right. old enough to, like, talk and stuff. I think he was, like, five or six. Okay. So he picks him up out of the car. The killer takes the kid to like a farmhouse and leaves him on the doorstep and then takes off. So, okay. So the kid like knocks on the door of this, it's like this farmhouse. So he tried to save the kid. Yeah. And, okay. and he says something to the effect of, he's like, my daddy's in the hospital sick. He's like, and I have to get home because my mommy and my uncle, which is what he called mm, all of the right. mom's boyfriends are both dead in the car. Right. So creepy. But Weird. yeah, so he didn't do anything to the kid, and apparently the kid never identified him or anything. So the farmer calls the cops, obviously. So then they go to the crime scene at the cemetery. They find, um, it was Antonio's car. They found eight twenty-two caliber shell casings around the car. Now the following morning, uh, police go to Barbara's house, and they talk to her husband, whose name is Stefano Mele. 
Now, as soon as they arrive at the house, Stefano is running out the door, like with a suitcase, like he's in a hurry, right? So the cops are like, huh, that's a little strange. They said, hey, your wife got murdered last night. And he's like, oh. He, he just seemed, they said that his reaction was very strange. Like he didn't really seem all that put out about it or upset about it. So, you know, the cops obviously thought that was very suspicious. So they said, okay, well, you need to come down to the station and like talk to us about some shit. So he gets Did down there. Did he know there. his wife was fooling around on him? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, maybe maybe there like, was no I think love every, lost. Everybody knew. Yeah. I think. It, it might have been, like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. From everything I've read, it seemed like, like pretty, fuck that bitch. pretty much everybody yeah. knew. Okay. So, at the police station, Stefano Melle says, no, well, I've been sick for the last few days, and, um, you know, I was at home. He's like, I even had a couple visitors over, both of whom were also lovers of his wife. Hmm. Um, and then while they were questioning him, he also brought up this other guy named Francesco Vinci, who was also having sex with his wife. What the fuck? How she's, old are these people? She's 32. How old was he? Um, Did they about that know, age? Actually, probably. He's yeah, like he's the cuck. cuck. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's cucked out. So, yeah. and evidently... Allegedly, he yeah. says too. He's like, "Oh, my wife's not only sleeping with Francesco Francesco Vinci, she's also sleeping with his other two brothers, <laughs> right? Damn. So she's busy. Who's he sleeping with? I don't know. Yeah, what a loser. <laughs> what? I know. Listen God to this damn, kitty. I, don't have to, I gotta do the show. Okay. She's like, I don't want to hear. I gotta that. do the show. I'm kitty. She's kitty centric. Yeah. It's a kitty world. Kitty centric. <laughs> So they keep interrogating him. The following day, he says, oh, well, she had so many boyfriends. It's like, I'm sure, like, a whole bunch of them are suspects, which obviously they would be. But then, no sooner has he said that, had he said that, than he said, oh, by the way, me and Salvatore Vinci, who was uh, Francesca's brother, we're the ones that killed her. What? He's like, what we were doing was I was bitching about her sleeping around. Um, Salvatore said, you know, you shouldn't let her do you that way. It's like, you know, everybody knows and it's really embarrassing. And he's like, maybe you should do something about it. So it's like, evidently, they both go and they go to the movie theater. They see Antonio's car outside. And then later on, they follow them. And apparently it was Salvatore Vinci's gun and shot him dead. Right. OK, so he confessed that. So then, uh, hold on. All these, uh, what? All these Italian names are confusing me. <laughs> Who was it that pulled the trigger? The, the, the husband? Or one of the yes. boyfriends? No, it was the husband. So yes. he got sick of it. The husband. Well, okay. that's what he said. That's what he said. He said it was Salvatore's gun, and Salvatore told him, you know, you need to do something about okay. that because it's humiliating. That's the story he gave. And yeah, that was the story he gave. So he okay. said, I went over there and shot them. And then I came back and told Salvatore Something that I did Something telling me it. that they think that the, he's lying about this. Yeah. Well, okay. they're not really sure. Not sure. All they're right. not really sure. Okay. So um, the weird thing, though, was that, I mean, had the dad been the one that killed because the son that was in the back seat, that was his dad. Yeah, he couldn't couldn't ID him. Uh, as far as I know, I think it was his. So, but I mean, she slept around so much that I'm not really sure. But um, you know, but she, but he didn't say, hey, it was that guy. You know what I mean? Right. She, he didn't seem to like say anything about that. But it, anyway, so they arrest him, right? So then the cops start looking for the gun and they don't find it. And now they come back and they ask uh, Stefano about it. And then suddenly he changes the story. He's like, um, no, I didn't throw the gun away. I gave it back to Salvatore. He has it. And then a couple hours later, he just said, never mind. I didn't really do it. So he recanted his confession, like pretty much the day after he made it. And then he said, oh, it was actually, it was Salvatore's brother, Francesco. Like I said, he was also. I'm kind of calling bullshit girl. on this. Why would you, why would you confess to a crime? Then the next day go, oh no, I was just lying. It was somebody else. Who knows? Who knows? I don't. I don't on. buy that. I think he did do it. So, I think he did do it, and then he realized, "Oh man, I just screwed myself. I shouldn't have said that." Well, you'll see how. Like the, that. I mean, you'll see how this whole okay, fucking right. thing goes. So you tell me, there's more to this? Well, okay. Yeah, there's all a right. lot more. There's a lot more. To this. Okay. <laughs> like I said, you you tell, right. you get like two facts, and then you go off on this big long thing. That's it's what like, I do. I'm like I'm like not even. This is like the first crime. That's what I do. There's I, like seven more. I'm the surrogate audience. You know, talking about <laughs> everybody else is jumping to conclusions too. The people listening, they're jumping to conclusions. Yeah. So I'm just letting you know what they're thinking. 
Well, you shouldn't jump to conclusions. Okay. <laughs> until you have all the facts. Stop messing with me. <laughs> so right. for the, so over the next three days, he's basically yeah. saying, no, it wasn't me. It was, you know, it was this other guy. It was Francesco. Uh, anyway, the police didn't really buy it. They put him on trial and he actually was found guilty as the lone gunman. Okay. So he was, he was arrested. He was convicted and he was put in prison. Now he only got 14 years because they called it partial insanity because I guess he was saying, Oh, I was so upset. Like they were treating it like they a crime of mass passion. Slaughter, mass slaughter. Yeah. They treated Here it like a crime mass of passion. Slaughter. Right. Right. Yeah. So there that set. So Stefano Melli is in prison. Six years later, in 1974, there was another double murder, a very similar double murder. This happened on September 14th, 1974. And there was this little uh, area that was just north of Florence. And this person walking by, they saw a car, and there was two dead people in it. This was 18-year-old Stefania Patini and 19-year-old Pasquale Gentilcore. And uh, they called the cops. So the cops get there. They find that the young man is in the car and he's like half naked. Presumably they were having sex in the car, like when the killer came up and started shooting at them. Um, he had been shot numerous times. Um, they found uh, these kind of copper jacketed shell casings. They found them all around the scene. So then behind the car, they find the naked body of the woman, Stefania. And she was like posed the killer had like spread her out, like her arms and legs were really spread out. And then they had taken like a grapevine branch and shoved it up her vagina. Yeah, Which is evil like in dead the evil style. Dead. Evil yeah. dead style. That's what I was thinking. I was like, oh, that's so creepy yeah. that we just did the evil now, dead. Now, hold on. Review. Before we go any further, you said that these shell casings were copper jacketed? Yes. Because there's a problem here, me being a small arms expert. Shell casings are b brass. All right, or their steel. Now, a steel casing, or that's like military, that's like mm -hmm. cheap military stuff, Soviet, usually. They must be talking about Eastern Bloc pistol cartridge washed in brass, right? Don't know. Brass, because it, it couldn't, you, brass or copper? Copper. Okay, probably copper washed, steel. There's no such thing as a copper jacket. Uh, copper uh, case. It's well, too soft. What so I'm they, just trying to figure out what it is they're talking about. They must be. Did, did they identify the caliber? Are they talking about nine millimeter Macarov? It's a 22 automatic Beretta. Okay, they didn't do that. With the 22s. bullets were a Winchester type that were manufactured in Australia during the 1950s. See, that's really odd. I think that's that was an, what I think that's discovered. an error in in in, in the uh, in the record there. Because 22 long rifle is always a brass casing. Now the bullets can be washed in copper, the projectiles, mm -hmm. but they're never jacketed. 22 long rifle, you can't jacket one. Long, uh, long story. I think there's a little. I, I'm just. There are some people in the audience that are firearm savvy, so I'm just trying to point out that there's a problem in the record there. That's not an accurate description of what they found. It was probably some kind of a. They must be talking about a copper washed projectile they found in 22 long rifle and cases in brass. That's the only thing I can think of. Okay. Just, so, just, just point it out. Anyway. Okay. Um, okay. So the bodies, the male victim, uh, had, was, uh, killed with five bullet wounds. Uh, the female had been killed, had been shot three times, but she had also been stabbed 96 times times with what appeared to be like a scuba diving type knife a very large uh knife um and as i said there were vaginal mutilations she was left Damn. with a grapevine uh sticking out of there so so there was that now like i said this was six years after the initial uh the initial murder now at first they had three kind of strong suspects one of these was a guy named bruno mocali he was uh 53 years old uh the other one was named giuseppe francini um, he actually confessed to the crime, but he was kind of, you know, a little bit crazy or maybe like mentally challenged. So they weren't really sure how seriously to take that. There was also a guy named Guido Giovannini. Uh, he was a voyeur. 
And uh, numerous witnesses had come forward and said, hey, we've seen him like creeping around, like spying on couples in their cars and stuff like that. So these three were like the focus of the initial investigation into this crime. Now, at this stage, like I said, six years had passed since the first murder. So police were not really connecting them so much. Um, that kind of happened later on. So they, you know, these three suspects that they had, you know, that that shit kind of went nowhere. And then the case in general just kind of went nowhere. Then it was several years later before there was another one. The next one happened in June of 1981. Now, there was a guy, he was actually a, a cop, and him and his son were out walking, and they came across, again, two bodies in a car. These were 21-year-old Carmela DiNuccio and her boyfriend, who was 30, his name was Giovanni Foggi. The carters were closed. The driver's side window was smashed open. The male victim was seated behind the wheel. It looked like his throat had been slashed. Hmm. Now, they found the female victim. She was actually not in the car. She was about 20 yards away from the car, like at the bottom of like a ravine. Same as with the previous victims. Her legs were like spread apart. Um, her, uh, her clothes were all slashed up. And her vagina had been removed damn now most of the mutilations as these cases went on um much like in the case of jack the ripper they're usually they, they don't say oh it was a surgeon or anything like that necessarily but they said it's somebody that knows how to handle these knives because it was done very efficiently so you know so that was the same kind of thing and they don't know they never found any of the pieces so they're assuming that the killer kept yeah, them, them yeah yeah them. like as a kind of a trophy yeah, or something used to do kind like, of that. Stuff like that yeah, yeah. Now, interestingly, this double murder, when they did ballistics tests on the shell casings that were found, they discovered that it was the same, that they had been fired from the same gun as the previous double murder. The same twenty two Beretta. Same huh. type of bullets. So, they're like, okay, well, obviously now this is a serial killer investigation. Right. So, then they have this suspect... Whose name was, again, with the cat. What's she doing? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> okay. It's 24-7 with these fucking cats. We put cats. one cat outside, and then the other one's like, well, I, now I have Tearing to make up for, <laughs> for the noise that she was making, yeah. and now I'm going to come make noise. Yeah. I'm just going to try and not pay attention. It's like kind of distracting. She's tearing furniture up. Yeah, she's out there making her little rounds around the furniture. Yeah. She, she runs around the outside of the uh, bottom. Upside like, down. Upside down with her. Dragging her back across the ground. Going, run. It just, when yeah. you see it, you just, she thinks she's a monkey. It is very funny. She though. thinks she's a monkey. Okay, so like I said, same gun, same bullet, same everything. So they think this is the same killer. Now, the main suspect that they have at this stage is a guy named Enzo Spalletti. Now, he is also a voyeur. Um, he had been... His car had been seen somewhere around the scene of the crime. His wife evidently also said that he told her about the murders on the morning, like after they happened, even, and he said he read about it in the paper, even though it wasn't printed in the paper until the following morning. So they thought that was a little weird. So he uh, actually got arrested and they put him in jail. However, while he was still in jail, on October 23rd, 1981, there was another one. So it obviously couldn't have been him, so they yeah. let him out. The one that happened in October of 1981 was 24-year-old uh, Susanna Camby and her boyfriend, who was 26. His name was uh, Stefano Baldi. And they were, same thing, they were in a car, like parked at a scenic outlook. And the same thing, the killer came up, uh, you know, shot them, basically just shot the man. Uh, he was half naked. Like I said, they were probably having sex in the car. The woman's body, she was generally, she was found naked. She'd been shot and stabbed and mutilated. Now her vagina was also removed, but this time it was like a lot sloppier um, and a much larger section of uh, the area was taken. Um, they said that part of her abdominal cavity was like open. So they're thinking that probably the killer was rushed, like someone was coming or something like that because it was a lot less... Uh, precise than the usual mutilations. He had just taken like a much larger chunk out of her. I know that's like fucking horrible. So yeah. So it said they'd both been shot through the front window and they were probably still alive. Like probably the gunshots didn't kill them. So at this point um, you know that this is when the media dubbed the killer because at this point they thought it was the same person doing all these. They dubbed him the monster of Florence. 
Uh, also known as the Surgeon of Death sometime or Il Mostro. Sometimes they call him that too. But like I said, it wasn't this Enzo guy because he was in prison when this other crime took place. So they basically just let him out because they said, well, obviously it wasn't him. So the next one that took place was June 19th, 1982. And this was um, Paolo Mayanardi, who was 22, and his girlfriend Antonella Milli Milliorini, who was 20. And they, same thing, they were having sex in a car. Someone came out of the bushes and started shooting at them. Um, Antonella was killed outright. Paolo actually lived, um, but he died afterwards. Like when they took him to the hospital, he never regained consciousness. So he couldn't tell them who it was. The interesting thing about it, though, was that the assistant DA at the time, he, they, well, actually it was a woman. They, they kept it on the down low that Paolo had died. Or that, you know, or that he uh, had never regained consciousness. They said, we're going to release it to the media that he was still alive after the crime, which was true. But he said, uh, we're going to say that he told the cops what the killer looked like. And, and we're going to see if ID. we can, like, shake him out, right? Yeah, smoke him out that way, yeah. Yeah, so it, it was actually kind of a smart thing to do. So they actually did do that. Now, it did seem to make a difference because, weirdly, after they published that in the press then the person who um i think it was the person that had driven yeah it was one of the emergency workers that had responded to the police call for the double murder they started getting all these really weird phone calls from somebody asking what paolo marinardi had said you know what i mean so presumably right. this was the killer like calling so that was like a good lead um but sadly it never came to anything so even though they did they made a gamble it, it did work out in the sense that this person was calling for i don't know why he was calling at one of the emergency workers that responded to that that just seemed and and the creepy thing too i don't think that was the killer i think is, it was newspapers it might not yeah, yeah. maybe but the weird thing too was that this particular emergency worker, they even got a call later on when they were on vacation yeah. somewhere else and they couldn't figure out how this person knew where that they were. That was the news and they media. The phone it might have been. That was the it news media. Been. It might not that. have been the case. They weren't trying to get the scoop. Right. So at this stage, they compare all the shells all the, the, from all the crime scenes and they figure out that the same gun has killed all of these people and all the bullets were from the same box. Okay. So, like I said, some people have been in jail. Some people have been arrested. Like I said, the the guy that was suspected in the first double murder, Stefano Mele, who was the husband of the first female victim, he's still in prison. So, obviously, he couldn't have done all of them. And like I said, the Enzo Spalletti guy, he was in prison. Like, they arrested him for one murder, and then there was another one while he was still in jail. That first guy who confessed to killing his wife... They know that the, that his wife was killed by that same firearm. They all or, of them were all of. Here's the, the thing, though. I guarantee you, they were all killed by a twenty-two. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it was the exact same twenty-two. Ballistic science, bl the ballistic science in terms of forensics, is not as good as people think it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. They've probably just narrowed it down to a yeah. They were all killed by twenty-twos. It was all the same brand of ammunition. The rifling pattern was the same, which means that it was the same brand of firearm. But that would sound like that would be, you know, a dead, you know, like 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 that that that, that would narrow it down. But no, twenty twos are very common. You know what I mean? Yeah. And a model of twenty two pistol can go into mass production, and in a place like Italy where they don't have a whole lot of guns, they might they might all be Berettas. You know, and there's a lot of those all concentrated into one area. We well, said they said it was a Beretta. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's lots of those there, and they probably only had one or two different brands of ammunition available in the country at that time, because you know they're they're tightly controlled there. So I guarantee you that was more than one shooter. I think that first guy did kill his wife. The rest of them was a different shooter. Well, like I said, that's why investigators suspect that. Stefano Mele, the, the first yeah. guy who killed the wife, and even some of the other people were the, that were suspects were kind of all working in tandem, like they were some kind of like gang or like some kind of culty type of thing. Because 
they do think they're all interrelated. Some of them did know each other. Um, so they think that there might be some of that kind of shit going on. It would it would be unlikely, but maybe. But but not impossible. Could it have been that just that they all were interrelated because they all lived in the same area? You know what I mean? And it meant this might... I don't know what the population density is in this area we're talking about. I don't know Italy that well. Well, Florence is very large. Yeah. But was this happening all in one neighborhood? No. No? It was, pre- it was pretty much usually in like the surrounding areas, like mm. around uh, Florence. Where's the evidence that there was a cult, though, or a group of them? Just because th- they kind of tangentially knew one another? Yeah. And like I said, a lot of them knew each other, like the suspects knew each other. Like I said, you know, they're operating under the assumption this is like, the, you know, the same gun or, you know, some the gun that had been used in the first one, they're pretty sure that it was used in the other one. And they know yeah. that one of the guys that was charged later, that, that was could, his gun. That could be one guy just working his way through a scene of friends, though. You yeah, it's I mean? possible. I think that's more likely than a group of people, you know what I mean, doing it. And it sounds like that same M.O. over and over again. Lover's Lane. Yeah. Taking trophies. Yeah. Pieces of women with... That That sounds like the work of one man. You know what I mean? Because how do you get a bunch... Of, how do you get a group of people to go along? Well, I don't you? think that they were all doing... I just think that they... They are thinking... It, it wasn't like, oh, there's four guys at each crime scene. They're just saying, oh, I did that one, and I did that one, and I did that one type of thing. I think that first murder was not really closely related to all the rest of them. I think all the subsequent ones after that were. But I think that first one is that that guy killed his wife out of jealousy and the and the, the boyfriend. He just happened to be using that same brand of pistol, which, was, which would have been common in that area, and that same brand of ammunition. And the police confused it. So they said, well... These, this group of murders here also used that same brand and that s- same brand of ammo and that same brand of pistol, so they must be interrelated. I don't think they really were. I'm just saying, statistically, you know what I mean? I, I can't prove it. I'm just saying it's more likely that it's two separate, two separate killers. They just kind of happen to be overlapped. You know what I mean? It happened within the same kind of group of friends. Well, yeah. that first, those, that first. Double homicide there. How is that linked in with the rest of them? What links them? Same ballistics, uh, same gun, same type of ammo. That's not enough. And same, uh, you know, same MO. Like, you know, same area they were parked in a car. Coincidence. I think it's coincidence. If you ask me, that's just what I'm going to say. Okay, so the next murder, the next double murder took place in September of 1983. Now, this one is kind of interesting because this is not a man and a woman in a car. It was two men. Now, most of the things about this crime say it's like, oh, they were homosexual lovers. They had homosexual porn in the car. I don't know if that's true or if that's just some shit that, you know, somebody made up somewhere. Um, It was just two guys. They were West Germans. They were like on vacation in Italy and they were camping and they were sitting in a car and somebody came up and uh, they were like in a camper and somebody came up and shot them. Now, they were obviously not mutilated. Police are speculating that this was the same killer. And that he thought that it was a man and woman in the car because one of the uh, individuals had kind of, he had long blonde hair that and he was very right. thin. Yeah. Um, and so he could have been mistaken for a woman right. from the back or from that far sounds away. Like, that sounds likely. And so because they weren't yeah. mutilated, they figured the killer just came up on and shot him and like, then oh, discovered it was man. two guys Whoa. and then just took yeah, off. and then left, right. Um, yes, yeah, so their names were Horst Meyer and Uwe Rusch Sens. Those were the two yeah. victims that time around. So, and again, same... It was a 22 Beretta, same, the Winchester ammunition, same type of thing. So, okay. At this point, obviously, they know this is a serial killer. Not only is there the same uh, modus operandi, not only is there the same, uh, you know, the same weapon, same ballistics, all that other kind of stuff, but also they said the interesting thing, too, was that all of the victims had been at discos uh, before on the night before they were murdered. Um, they all, almost all were killed on Saturday night. Almost all of them were killed, uh, during the new moon and shit like that. Um, and sometimes, most of the female victims had their purses and stuff like rummaged through, like the person was trying to find some kind of trophies to take or something like that. At this stage, they're, they're starting to think, you know, they're approached, the police are approached by like a religious historian who says, Hey, maybe it's a satanic cult or some shit like that. So then a year goes by and then there's another one. July 29th, 1984. This was just north of Florence. 
and this was pretty much textbook just like the other ones were uh the man's body was in the back seat of the car he just had like an undershirt and underwear on and then outside of the car like behind the bushes was the naked body of the female victim and she had been stabbed a hundred times had her vagina removed also had her left breast removed yeah that's that same killer right so you know again same gun same everything same knife even the, they're they're saying it's like it's the same knife yeah. same size and everything so far the only problem i have with this is that i don't think that first double homicide is directly related to the other ones there is a serial killer here yeah it's just that that first double homicide was that was the husband it yeah, just happened to be using possible, the same yeah. ammo and the same pistol that's all yeah. and in a place like italy they're not gonna have a big choice a big variation in terms of guns and ammo like a good example in brazil in Brazil, everything's either a Rossi or a Taurus. That's the only thing they can get their hands on. Yeah. And when you talk about 22s, the most common one they have is a little nine-shot Taurus revolver. And everybody has that fucking gun in Brazil, pretty yeah. much. And you know, then then the only the only uh, ammunition they have is CBC. So if you shoot somebody with that nine-shot Taurus using that CBC ammo, you're gonna have that same footprint as everybody else out there. You know what I mean? And that in that gun and that ammo selection has a vast swath of the market. Italy's going to be the same kind of deal. They're not like the United States where you can just get your hands on anything, you know. That's what you're seeing. So, the next couple that were murdered, this is the last known monster of Florence crime. This took place on September 8th, 1985. Again, this was a vacationing couple. They were French. Um, they were in a tent uh, just outside of Florence. They were camping out. Uh, apparently the killer came up, cut a hole in the tent and started shooting. Um, the woman was shot four times, uh, in the head and the throat. And, uh, the man was also shot four times in the face and in the arm. Um, evidently they said the shots had been fired very close range, uh, less than 12 inches. Um, they said that the couple were probably having sex at the time. They think the woman was on top of the man when, you know, the person just cut up in the tent and started shooting in there. Um, so evidently the, uh, the guy, like the woman was killed outright because she got shot in the head. The man was shot, but apparently tried to run away because they found him a little way away. Um, and then the killer stabbed him to death. And then the killer goes back into the tent and cuts out the woman's vagina and also takes her left breast again. Now, the creepy thing about this is that later on the killer sent like a, a very zodiac type letter it was like a letter with pasted uh you know letters from magazines and shit like that and it included her nipple yeah to prove that it, it was yeah him. so that's nice <clears throat> this guy really kind of reminds me more of son of sam though yeah although i mean very recently close, it similar, has been but... speculated that um the zodiac and this person were the same person no. i'm not buying it but Hell, so, no. like some guy named bevilacqua i think his name no, is like somebody wrong. just put forth that theory they're just, just trying to sell you. books or something so. yeah so no all right so to me that... it sounds like an italian son of sam, son of sam type yeah. case so that was the last of the so-called monster of florence crimes now, over the following years, in the 1990s, another suspect begins to come to the fore, and his name is Pietro Pacciani. Now, he was 68 years old at the time. Um, kind of, he was a farmer, uh, not super bright, uh, kind of not really all that literate. Um, he had actually, he'd been arrested for a murder before in 1951. He had murdered a salesman who had come to his door. Uh, he had stabbed him and, st and like, stomped him to death. So, you know, uh, he had been in prison for 13 years. And then, actually, after he got out, he supposedly had a normal life, got married, had some daughters. But then uh, he was arrested again in 1987 for spousal abuse and for molesting his daughters. So, they're also... So, when they you know, arrest this guy and they're questioning this guy. Apparently, and this, again, this is where the occult, you know, thing is coming from too, is that they figure out that Pacciano is in this little loose group of sort of like occult interested people uh, with three other guys whose names are Mario Vanni, Giovanni Faggi, and Giancarlo Lotti, uh, who were also like peeping Tom type dudes. They would like go out at night and look at people's windows and all this other kind of shit. 
they also allegedly, according to witnesses, had black masses where they used, like, you know, female body parts and stuff like that, which made police very interested because, you know, obviously all these women's vaginas were being taken. So there, I mean, there was some kind of like, um, controversy about that because some of the cops were like, no, he's too much of a dummy to have yeah. like planned these. He, you know, he was barely I'm not buying it. and stuff like that. Um, so actually they, uh, they put him on trial in 1994. It was like a huge thing. It was in all the newspapers. It's like they, the, um, prosecutors wanted it to be tele televised. So for this group much, of murders or just the one that he did? Um, for, yeah, the, for this group of murders. This group for pretty, of murders. For pretty much most of them. How the hell did Other they Other than the first two, I think. Okay. So, so they put him on trial in 1994 but again, you know, they didn't have a hell of a lot of, you know, really solid evidence. That's a they had stretch. a lot of circumstantial evidence. Yeah. Um, he did get convicted uh, eventually and sentenced to life in prison. For um, that group of murders. Yeah, very yeah. famously, very famously, as they were dragging him out of court, he said he was as innocent as Christ on the cross. Probably, probably yeah. true. Although he did a bunch of, he did do he the did murder, some other shit. He though. did the murder in 1951, and right. he did beat his wife and molest his daughter. So you know, right. I don't feel too bad for him. I'm guaranteeing. <laughs> yeah, I, well, you know, Italy's kind of notorious for framing people for for murders. I mean, they well, got now, a fucking terrible criminal justice system. He actually, um, his uh, conviction was overturned uh, yeah. not that long afterward in 1996. Uh, yeah, I am buying that. The dude who did all those uh, shootings, all right, I'm telling you, was a young guy and he was an incel. You know what I mean? He wasn't married. He didn't have daughters. He was a he was a he was a Berkowitz type guy. Uh, young nerd, angry, and you know a typical incel. He was like that. That's who that was. Who would be driven to to that kind of rage? Why focus in on people having sex? You know. Yeah. But um, okay. So anyway. Like I said, he had these three associates, so they kind of start looking into the associates. 1997, two of the associates, uh, Mario Vanni and Giancarlo Lanti, they went on trial also for five of the double murders. Um, they were also convicted, sentenced to life. Uh, the first guy was sentenced to life. The second guy was sentenced to 26 years. Um, Pacciani was actually going to be retried uh, after they kind of found some new evidence and after some of the other, uh, you know, one of the other guys like uh said that he that Pachani was involved um but he actually died before he could be brought back to trial okay so mario vani and giancarlo lotti were still in jail Pacciano died uh before he could be retried in 2001 the investigation was reopened to see if they could find any more uh people um they actually said at this point that they had 10 to 12 uh more suspects yeah. that they were looking at and like i said they thought it was some kind of ritualistic uh, you know, web of kind of wealthy yeah. uh, sort of people that yeah. were kind of all acting together. Yeah, they're lying. <clears throat> so they actually raided some people's houses, like some yeah. kind of higher up people, and found evidently found some incriminating uh, photos and things like that in their houses. So, uh, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, so I think the last thing, like I said, the last thing that happened with this was... Um, yeah, somebody published something in 2018, as I said before, uh, somebody saying that they think that this is the same person as the Zodiac, uh, Giuseppe Bevilacqua. And they actually have, they've actually figured out, you know, the, um, I think it's like the eight, last 18 characters of the, of the uh, cipher that were never uh, deciphered, the first Zodiac cipher. Um, they claim that that says his actual name, that, that, that spells out his actual name. Which he is must Bevilacqua. have heard about the Zodiac case. But yeah, like I said. So at this stage, like I said, two of the guys that were like suspected are in jail. One of the guys is dead. They claim they have a bunch of more uh, suspects. They think that it's at least four people, that it's not just one person. So, and that's pretty much where the Monster of Florence case stands. Like I said, uh, Hannibal is kind of based on this case, like not just the, kind of the subplot is based on this. There was actually a really good book about it. I can't remember who wrote it now, but it's like a nonfiction book that was kind of about this case also. So if you want to check that out, you should. I'll put the link in the description because I can't remember the name of the author right now. But it's actually, it's it's one of Italy's most famous cases. It's, it's weird that it's not better known here because... It's like I said, it's very similar to the Zodiac, very similar to Phantom Killer type stuff. Yeah. And there's, you know, the whole genital mutilation thing. But yeah, so that was the Monster of Florence case. We're going to take a break right now because we've gone on and on and on. Yeah. And then after we come back, we will talk about another European true crime case. 
the serial killer known as the Vampire or the Butcher of Hanover. Pervy ass Europeans, man. No, because of pervy. So, yeah. They're pervy. You, so we're Americans? Okay. All right. <laughs> Like, there's a difference. I was gonna, I was gonna, yeah. There's some fucked up people here, too. I've talked about all kind of fucked up shit on here. Okay. All right, so we're going to take a break. We will be back in just a minute. shirt designs up four of them really good ones too atlanta ripper who put bella in the witch elm the hh holmes murder castle and of course demon child because man said he could these are updated designs i think they look really cool jenny did a great job on them were they fun making jenny they were very fun and thank you very much i think they came out very good yeah they're really good they're very high quality shirts jenny and i wear shirt uh, our own shirts at, at certain times when we're trying to put a spotlight on ourselves and you can put a spotlight on yourselves if you go ahead and pick up one of these shirts today, you guys are going to love them. Link's in the description, www.zazzle.com at 13 o'clock. Yeah, so go check out our store at www.zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. We got these four cool new t-shirt designs, plus all our old ones, if you'd rather get one of the old ones. But these ones are awesome, and you should check them out. They're also available in Women's Cut, and they look really cute. JD's got some. So thank you. Go check them out. This European true crime spectacular. Yeah, and I'm running with Kugel Khan. You Pretty are. Deep, right? I yeah, know. <laughs> I know people love it when when I you know when I start running hard with Kugel Khan. You know, I guess I'm the comedic relief. Yeah, I suppose. Sometimes, in a way. <laughs> yeah. I suppose or, to, supposed to serve as the audience. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I only know what the audience knows, so I'll answer. Que- I'll ask questions. You know what I'm talking about? Unless they know more about the case than they you might do, know more than me. But that's not the audience. That's individuals within the audience. Ooh, deep. Yeah, okay. All right. So this was actually Monster Florence was uh, recommended. This was also recommended, and this was a ser- another serial killer that I had never heard of. I'm really need to get up on my serial killers. I mean, I'm a true crime writer for fuck's sake, and there's yeah. still so many that I haven't heard of, which I guess is kind of horrifying because there's right. so many of them out there. Now, this was actually a long time ago. This guy, alternately known as the Vampire of Hanover, the Butcher of Hanover, or the Wolfman. Okay. This guy, uh, they know who he is. His name is Friedrich Fritz Harmon. Sounds familiar. Yeah. He murdered uh, between the years of 1918 and 1924 that they know of. Murdered between 24 and 27 uh, boys and young men. Although he confessed that probably it was more like 50-ish and they just never found the people, which Hmm. probably was the case. So he was a homosexual killer? Yes. All right. Now, he was actually... um, Here's the thing. Like, he grew up in a very poor family. And, like, you know, this was the late 19th century in Germany. You know, there was a lot of, you know, bad shit going on. 
So evidently he showed um, sadistic tendencies from quite a young age. He used to really dig like tying up his sisters and doing all that kind of stuff and like scaring them. He really got off on uh, fucking with people and inflicting pain, inflicting fear. He also showed uh, homosexual tendencies very early. Uh, he always preferred like hanging out with girls, doing kind of girly, playing with dolls, um, you know, doing baking and things like that, which were considered feminine at the time. Um, also when he got a little bit older, uh, he was kind of like a tall, well-built fella, but he, uh, he had a bit like a very womanly voice and, you know, the way he walked was very, uh, you know, very stereotypically gay, I suppose. Um, so he had ambiguous sexuality. So there was that thing. But the interesting thing, like he goes to school, he doesn't do very well in school. Um, you know, obviously he's got some mental problems. Uh, they called it at the time, they uh, they called it dementia praecox, which I think is kind of like the old timey term for schizophrenia. Um, but he, he was recognized as like having some mental problems quite early on. Um, so he actually did go to a military academy and he really liked it there. Um, and he did quite well, uh, as far as I know, but they actually let him go after he started having seizures. Um, mm. I don't know if it was epileptic seizures or if they just said, they just said like he kept get going unconscious and he kept like having all these, so he had like a lot of mental problems and a lot of health problems. That could be anything. Right. Right. So, right around... Now, he was born in 1879. I don't know if I said that. In those that. days, that now, could have even been diabetes. Yeah. Because they go into... Know. You know, diabetes... The diabetics sometimes pass out. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So, around uh, the end of the 19th century, around 1898, he was actually arrested for child molestation. Hmm. Now, when he stood trial for this, they said that he was psychologically unfit to stand trial, so they sent him to a mental institution. Hmm. Now, he was there for about six months, and then he escaped. And then he went to Switzerland. So he stayed in Switzerland for a while. He came back to Germany when he was about 20 years old, and he actually uh, married a woman named Edna Lowert, and he got her pregnant, but then he abandoned her. Hmm. Then he joined the army. Like I said, uh, when they interviewed him later on, he said actually being in the military was like the happiest time of his life. Um, most of his superior officers said that he was a very good soldier. He was very obedient. He was a, he was an excellent marksman. Um, and he did like a, a very, he was like really into it and he did a really good job. However, um, apparently during a military exercise, he kept like collapsing again. It's this sort of un unspecified like mental illness or unspecified physical illness that he has so he keeps collapsing and they are like well you can't stay here because you can't you can't do your duties you have some kind of mental deficiency so he was discharged and he went back to live with his family now they um, this is so funny like his parents evidently him and his dad did not get along so his dad tries to put him in a, another mental institution the mental institution wouldn't take him because the doctor said he was quote unquote morally inferior. What does that mean? Which I was like, that could mean a lot of things. <laughs> does that mean does that mean gay? It could mean that. It, that could very well be like a euphemistic because yeah. you have to, this was like yeah like 1900 or something. Maybe they at, maybe they were maybe interviewing him. They, they asked, this "Well, I like men. I don't really like women." They were like, "Oh, you can't be." In because here. from and everything I've read about Fritz Harmon. Um, they said he was very obviously gay. Yeah. Um, and he didn't apparently make much of a secret of it. Right. So that's probably I'm what guessing that's about. probably what they mean. So they said, this, okay, this well, we can't passing out him. thing, man, for some reason I'm thinking this is, uh, epilepsy, not epilepsy, uh, diabetes. I'm thinking it's diabetes. I don't even think it knew about diabetes that, back then, did they? Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know when it was it... discovered. Now I have to like Wikipedia. Yeah, like, I, yeah I, 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 bet, I bet you that. <laughs> I bet you that's diabetes. It's probably nothing more than that, because if he he did well in a structured environment, he liked the military. Yeah. So I don't think there would be any kind of mental stress on him. You know, a lot of guys love the military. You know, especially uh, guys that end up having problems like this. Yeah. So I think the only thing that would prevent him from thriving was some kind of a physical ailment. And passing yeah. out, you know, I don't really think there'd be enough flashing lights to bring on epilepsy. You know, I bet you it was nothing more than just diabetes. 
I'm sure. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Sure. Yeah, blood sugar gets low. You fall. Yeah. You're falling out. You know. So after I've done that. Yeah. A few times myself. I have like yeah. super low blood pressure. That's all I've probably I've like dead person blood pressure. But yeah, so okay, so he gets out of the military. He doesn't go to an asylum because he's morally inferior. Um, he tried to open up a business for a little while, but it didn't really work out. So he said, Well, I'm just gonna go into a life of crime. Now the first crimes that he got kind of into, uh well, he was a con man, uh pretty much. He would uh I know this, this is very weird, but I guess in this period of Germany, you know, was, you know, people didn't, um, you know, it was very poor. They didn't have a lot of things. And so there was like a big black market in like stolen clothing and all of these kind of things that people couldn't get normally. So he actually would do that kind of stuff. He started trading in like clothing and meat and things like that, like on the black market. Now he got arrested a whole bunch of times like in this ensuing period. And he got so well known to the police in Hanover where he lived that he eventually said, because the police force was kind of so understaffed and you know, they didn't really have, so they, so they were like encouraging the public to be like informant. So he said, well, I'll be a police informant, which is kind of funny when you turn out that he turned out to be a serial killer later on. But he's like, yeah, he started being a police informant in 1918, which also uh, was, that would also serve to kind of, allay suspicion from him. He's like, I'm a police informant. I would never yeah. be a serial killer. Of course not. Why would you even... And it worked for a while. Uh, it worked for about six years, actually. Six, seven years. <laughs> but he did have some kind of misdemeanors and shit like that in there. But then came September 25th, 1918. And evidently, his first victim that they know of was a 17-year-old named Friedel Rotha. And... He, what he would do, what, uh, what Harmon would do, he liked to pick up guys or teenage boys, like from the Hanover train station. And he would either tell them that he was a cop or tell them because he was a police informant, or he would tell them that he had a job for them. And, you know, since it was kind of a lot of runaways and stuff like that. So he was kind of getting like a pretty steady supply of like these kind of teenage runaways and stuff like that. Hey, come back to my house. I'll give you a meal. I'll give you some work. Um, you know, or I'm a cop, I'm arresting you for whatever. And then he would take them back and kill them. So he takes this first boy and they didn't find out about this until much later on, but he takes the first boy back to his house. And because the, um, his friends had seen this boy going with Fritz Harmon, the friends reported it to the police. So the police actually raided Fritz Harmon's apartment after this first victim. They didn't search it though. Now they didn't find the original kid, but they did find Fritz Harmon in bed with another kid. Yeah. Right? Like a 13 year old boy or something like that. He's in bed with him. Yeah. So he actually got arrested for sexual assault. Right. Now later on, after all of his crimes came to light and stuff, he's like, oh, I'm so glad the cops didn't search the apartment at the time because the original kid's head was wrapped up in newspaper and stashed behind the stove. Hmm. So, you know. And the other kid in bed with him didn't know? Evidently not, not yeah. no. He was just like a little kid. Right. Yeah. Where's the rest of the body? I don't... Well, no, I'll, I'll get to Okay. That. So, he eventually gets out. Uh, you know, he like I said, he got arrested on the sexual assault charge. Um, but, like I said, they didn't search his house, so they didn't think he had anything to do with the original kid's murder, who was named Friedel Rotha, like I said. Now, at this point, at the train station, the same place where he picked up all his victims, he meets this guy named Hans Granz. Now, Hans Granz, evidently, he was kind of a con man, too, like a low-level con man. Now, he approached Fritz Harmon because, like I said, he, he saw that Fritz Harmon was a gay man. Now, Hans was heterosexual. He had a girlfriend and everything like that, but he was kind of trying to make some money. And he's like, oh, well, here's a gay man. I'm going to go up there and offer my sexual services and maybe I'll get some money out of it. You know, he was being like (laughs) male prostitute, right? Mr. Gigolo. So he comes up to him and the two of them strike up a friendship. Now, the creepy thing is like the two of these guys, they eventually moved in together. And like Hans knew about all of this shit. Like, I don't know if, I don't think he killed any of the victims or anything like that, but they did live together and he did know about it. I mean, he knew that he was killing the guys. Yes. He he just let it roll. Yes. Let it ride. He did know. Damn. Yeah. So he's a crook, too. Yeah, so they move in together. Yeah. 
And at this stage, like Fritz Harmon is just, he's just kind of going and fucking. So what he would do, like I said, his, his usual MO, he goes to the train station, tries to pick up runaways. He says he's a cop usually. Um, and he says, I'm arresting you for whatever. Um, then he would take the boys back to his place. Sometimes he would keep them for a few days, like raping them and stuff like that. How he would kill them was he would simultaneously strangle them and also pull out their Adam's apple, like with his teeth. Like he would bite what? their throat and like pull, like while he was strangling them. Yeah, which is uh, which is why he got uh, the epithet, the vampire God Hanover damn. or the Wolfman. And how these were like? How old were these kids? Um, gen- the youngest one was ten. Okay. Uh, they were anywhere from like ten to early twenties. Okay. Uh, usually, they were usually teenagers. So he must have had some physical physical strength to him. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. like I said. He the way he walked, the way he talked was effeminate. But ev- yeah. everything I've read about him said he was you know a rather well built, like a broad shoulder. Now he kind came of in fella. his apartment, rape him over a couple of days. Wonder sometimes, how he, sometimes. Okay, I wonder how he kept control over them. They must have been tied up, or we just maybe keep a mental control over. Yeah. Him. The creepy thing too is that what he would do. Yeah. Is he would general he would cut them up. Yeah. Now he would there's actually no solid evidence of this, but they're assuming that this is what because he dealt in black market meat. Oh. So yeah, and most I'm of them see this is going. most of the meat that he sold was in mints form. Yeah, he's grinding them up. Yeah. So they're pretty sure that the a lot of the meat that yeah. he sold was human. Meat. Yeah, this has happened several times in the history of serial killers. I mean, they have yeah. one dude that he won some kind of chili contest with uh, victim meat in the chili. That's some weird <sighs> shit, man. The secret ingredient. It's just They're like getting Motel off Hell. on the fact that other people are eating the evidence. Eat, yeah, eat them up. Oh, man. God. Now, seriously, like, he had killed a lot of people, like I said. they There's 24 to 27 that they know of, you know? And they know that there was a lot more than that because in this period, like, between the wars in Germany... You know, there was a lot of poverty. There was a lot of runaways. Uh, there was a lot of crime. They're like, shit. It just in the first year he started killing, there were like 600 like young boys that had run away from home that they were missing and they didn't know where they were. So, you know, he was kind of operating in this yeah. in this kind of area where who knows how many fucking people. He, he wasn't even sure, honestly. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to remind any new listeners, any new viewers, that era... That era 1800s, early 1900s, you could get away with some serious shit. There wasn't there wasn't any paperwork. Yeah. Not to speak of. That's what I mean. Like the I said, paperwork they had no was such weak. thing as the good old days. No, it wasn't the good old days. Look at H.H. H. Holmes. Shit. He built a damn murder palace. Yeah, and the thing is, is like even like all the serial killers, here's the thing. There was probably like a shit ton of serial killers back then, one that they don't even know about because yeah. they never caught them. Um, two, even the ones that they did catch... I bet they killed a lot more people than they know of. Yeah. Because all you had to do, like I said, and I think I've said this before, all you had to do was move to another fucking state and change your name and no and one would it. know shit. Yeah. No one would know jack shit. Yeah, here's no the weird thing. I mean, he he's biting these kids' throats out. How does he how does he keep the sound down? What kind of apartment is this? I have no idea. Weird. The creepy thing too is that when he when he killed the second kid, yeah. right, his second victim. Yeah. Evidently Hans Granz, his little his roommate. Yeah came home and saw the dead body on the bed like after it happened all han said was oh should i come back later oh, like man. something like that i'm like oh my god so yeah, yeah. so like i said he killed so that guy was fucking brutal shit tons of people yeah he killed like shit tons of people this way and what he would normally do they didn't find out about him because like i said he'd been in prison he'd been like for little shit mostly i mean some of it was sexual assault that's not little shit but i mean just like for con man type shit um, so the police knew of him and obviously he was an informant and he was supposedly helping them, oh, but they didn't, um, they didn't relate him to any of these boys going missing. Right. But then in 1924, these two little kids are like playing, uh, along the Lina river and they found, I think they found a skull, right. Or like a jaw or part of a skull. Yeah. And when they start like dredging the river and looking around the river, they found like, 500 bones that they think belong to at least 22 to 24 people and later on when they interviewed fritz Harmon, he said yeah that's what i would do he's like i would grind the the flesh up for meat 
And he's like, then I would usually try to smash up the bones kind of, and then I just threw them in the river. So this whole doing... fucking river, they dredged it, and there's just like full of bones that he's been throwing in there over was the years. Was he doing this in his apartment? Yeah. Okay. All right. It's fucking crazy, man. Yeah. Now, the creepy thing. So at this stage, uh, the last person he killed was another 17-year-old. His name was Eric DeVries. This guy's sounding a lot like Dahmer. Yeah, he's very Dahmer. Very much like Dahmer. Yeah, yeah he's like the proto Dahmer. Yeah, I want to say like the German proto Dahmer. <laughs> so at this stage, when he killed the last victim, police are already you know suspecting. Obviously, there's a serial killer, and they're kind of doing this big manhunt. And he um, he actually did kind of come onto their radar, so the police started to watch him. So in 1924, in June of 1924, um, they caught him trying to lure a 15-year-old boy named Carl Fromm from the train station where he normally picked up all his victims. Now, apparently, Fromm told them, he's like, yeah, I was in um, his apartment before, like, for several days, and he raped me a bunch of times. But see, the thing is, homosexuality was obviously very illegal back then. You could go to jail for it. So I think he kind of used that to his advantage because he knew that even if he raped the boys and let them go they're not gonna tell anybody because you know they might go to prison or they might you know get aspersions cast upon them so i think he used that to his advantage like he was canny enough to do that so yeah so this kid said yeah i was there before and he raped me a bunch of times and then uh fritz finally was like yeah i was gonna kill him but you know i decided not to or whatever so finally the police go and they search uh, Fritz's apartment finally and there's just blood everywhere now at first Fritz is saying oh well you know I'm in the meat business so I'm just you know butchering carcasses not humans I swear like in my fucking apartment right but yeah he didn't really they didn't really fall for that so it didn't actually take all that long before Fritz was like yeah you got me it's me so he did actually confess right away and they said that he was actually pretty forthcoming uh once they once they had him in custody and they were like look we know it's you and all this other stuff so he actually did kind of uh you know give up all the details they said weirdly the only time that he would get uh quiet was one when he was confronted with the families of the victims because yeah. he did like some of the parents of the boys like would came and like talk to him and then he'd get really really quiet or when they talked about beheading hmm. like that seemed to bother him a lot because he did behead most of his victims i mean a lot of the victims were just found skulls and shit like that so like i said he said that he couldn't really remember how many people he killed. He's like, it might be 50, might be 100, I'm not sure. It's 24 to 27 that they know of that are, like, positively identified that were, you know, attributed to him. So he was actually put on trial in 1924. One of the weird quotes that he used to say was that he really wanted to be decapitated. Like, he thought that would be... I don't know if, like, he thought it would be some kind of sexual rush... No. That's kind of the impression that I get. Like the way thought he it'd talks. be quick. Either that or he thought that it would be kind of like a uh, just rewards. Maybe. Yeah. But it's, I don't know, it's like super creepy. He might have had some kind of weird fetish about it. Yeah. yeah. Then the weird thing too was that at his trial, he also tried to pin a bunch of the shit on Hans, his roommate. Um, the creepy thing is that Hans actually did get convicted of one of the murders or accessory to the murder... And he got executed. Yeah. But then later on, because I think he was executed first, and then Fritz Harm was executed later, and he was like, oh, by the way, Hans didn't do anything. You executed an innocent guy. Like, how do you like that kind of thing? So, (laughs) yeah, it was that that type of shit. Yeah, but Hans knew about it. Yeah, he did. He did. uh, He knew all those kids were going to be killed, so really he wasn't innocent, if you ask me. Yeah, so there was, like, this whole kind of fucking sick game between his, like, yeah, I'm just trying to, like, do it all off on Hans and shit like that. So the trial lasted about uh, two weeks. Uh, He got convicted of all but three of the murders they were trying to pin on him. And actually in uh, April of 1925, they actually did, they cut his head off with a guillotine. Yeah, all right. And uh, (laughs) they actually, here's the sad thing. Like, because like I said, he dumped most of the remains in the river lane and they found like all these bodies was like at least 22 people. So they they're all buried like in a mass grave there's Mm. like a big huge like a triptych uh gravestone with all their names on it 
uh, you know, still there, obviously. But I, I, you know, I don't know. I just I thought that was really weird, really creepy, really creepy. First, I've heard of this guy. Yeah, they were, uh, and he sounds a lot like Dahmer. He does, yeah. He didn't eat. He didn't eat any of them himself. Well, he did bite into their throat. He bite. He called it his love bite. Oh, really? Yeah. Isn't that fucked up? Pulling their Adam's apple out with his yeah. teeth. That, that must take quite a force to do that, though. That's what I was thinking. I'm like, God yeah. damn. Maybe he lied. He must have some strong jaw power. Maybe he lied, though. It could be because, like I said, I don't. You know, I don't think they they didn't find any bodies intact. Yeah. They were like pretty much all bones, and they'd been cut apart. Yeah. And he might have sold the meat. Yeah. I mean, also, when they searched his apartment, they found, like, a bunch of clothes that belonged to a lot of the missing people. Yeah. And he was trying to write it off, like, oh, I'm, you know, because not only did he deal in black market meat, he also dealt in black market clothes. He's like, yeah, I got clothes, you know. I don't yeah. know where I got those from, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, he confessed in the end. So they fucking knew how he did and knew what he did. So, yeah, uh, they actually kept his head for a long time uh, at, <laughs> at the medical school. <laughs> they kept it in a jar. But then in uh, 2014, they finally cremated it. So that, fuck, man. It's like, listen to this shit. This is, this is a quote that I found from this motherfucker. And this is him describing what he would do with the victims. He's like, I'd make two cuts in the abdomen and put the intestines in a bucket. Then soak up the blood and crush the bones until the shoulders broke. Now I could get the heart, lungs, and kidneys and chop them up and put them in my bucket. I take the flesh off the bones and put it in my wax cloth bag. It would take me five or six trips to take everything and throw it down the toilet or into the river. I always hated doing this, but I couldn't help it. My passion was so much stronger than the horror of the cutting and chopping. <laughs> he had he had that thing like that some serial killers have where because he had some other quotes too where he's just like Sometimes he would have these kids at his house and he's just like, I knew that if they were there a long time, like something bad was going to happen. Like I couldn't help myself and all this right. other. He had that kind of shit. Yeah. So, yeah. And like I said, that fucking shit about like tearing out their throats and like calling them love bites and stuff like that. That's fucking, yeah. And uh, he sodomized some of them also. Like I said, yeah. he was he was also a rapist uh, in addition to being a murderer and then they would take all well, their stuff then he would take all their stuff their, their clothes and their possessions and stuff and sell them on the black market and yeah. allegedly sell their meat on the black market as well well a serial killer is primarily a serial rapist they just kill the well victim. yeah you've said yeah. that before yeah. right they're, they're they're rapists first yeah that's why they're doing it yeah. interestingly and i did not know that know this until i started uh researching this case but the very famous movie M yeah. is partially based on this guy. Huh. Um, there have actually been a couple of movies based on this guy. Uh, one of them is called The Tenderness of Wolves yeah. from 1973. And uh, one of them called is called The Death Maker that yeah. came out in 1985. That is also based on him. Yeah, a serial killer is a serial rapist. Yeah. Uh, but you have guys like, you know, Berkowitz, uh, Son of Sam, you know, like Berkowitz, guys that just shoot people in lovers' lanes, like the first one. The reason why they're really not raping people is because they can't get it up. They That's all it is. They, they can't suspect get it up. that they, might be the case in right. the Monster of Florence yeah. thing. If it's not a cult thing, I have yeah. heard some people they say that, rape people, that they it was can't. probably a rape. Particularly they, because the second set, the second uh, yeah. woman that was killed had like the grapevine like, yeah. inserted into they, her. They vagina. have performance anxiety. Yeah. And they may be virgins. Yeah. So that's something else you have to put, you know, take into account. Yeah. They don't know how to have sex. They're scared that they're scared they won't, their, their, their performance will be bad. So they just shoot a bitch. That's in their mind. That's I'm going to shoot a bitch. That's obviously so much better. Yeah, so much better. Well, you know, they're sad sacks, like man. A normal person. They're sad sacks. I don't get it. But yeah, so again, like I was saying before about uh, about Hans Granz, uh, Fritz mm. Harmon's roommate, it should be noted that one of the victims had uh, a handkerchief that had um, Hans's name on it, like stuffed into his throat. Hmm. So I'm thinking... Like I said, Hans got executed, and then, like, afterward, Fritz was like, nah, he didn't do it. You killed an innocent guy. Ha, ha, ha. But, like... Nah, I do wasn't innocent. Yeah, I don't think... Like I just said, I don't know if he killed any of the dudes, but he for sure knew about it. I mean, he lived with the guy. It. Yeah, he knew about He it. was bringing, like, dudes... He was bringing kids home from the fucking train station all yeah. the time. And like I said, who knows how many people it was. So it was only, like, a six-year period. You don't period. report a crime like that, then you're guilty of that crime. 
I mean, think about much, it. You just watch it happen. I yeah. mean, unless you're like fucking tied up and you Hell can't yeah. do anything, or the, unless the guy like threatens to kill you. Or something if if like you that. don't, if if you don't, you know, go in there and stop it, you're guilty. If you ask me. Like well, I, I saw said, some it, shit like that out of best of that, out of beat that motherfucker's ass. Like I said, unless there's take, some exonerating circumstance, like you can't get away. Cut or them like, children some, loose, man. I'm yeah. not scared of that dude. If I was living with him and if, if he was bigger than me, I couldn't handle him. I'd just go get a gun or a knife. Yeah. And then right. go to the cops. Analyzer. Something like that, yeah. But yeah, like I said, the sad thing was like they didn't even know what this fucking guy was doing until like some kids found a fucking skull in the yeah. river and then they just started dredging up. I was like, what the, who the fuck are all these people? I said knife. That was just something off the top of my head. Really, knives suck in comparison to just a damn stick. The blunt force trauma. It's got stopping power. Everybody's always wanted to go for these knives. Just get a baseball well, bat. Well, you have to stab in a st- pretty yeah, specific yeah, yeah. Places. It takes too long, but a nice big punk to the head just knocks them out. That's Wait. what I mean. It's like I'm just saying, like I don't know, you know yeah. what I mean. I'm not, I'm not a murderer or nothing uh, well, like that. Know. But it's like, but I've done a lot of research in this area. Just look up medieval weapons. Yeah, it's like even people that are shot or stabbed or something like you have yeah. to like hit them in pretty yeah. in a, a few very strategic locations for them to die because people have been stabbed multiple times and still live. People have been shot multiple times and still lived. If you take a big ass baseball bat like you said and crack someone in the back of the skull, they can't. They can't. They're resist probably it. not gonna get up. I mean, even in the medieval times, you know, pound for pound, when you were dealing with somebody who was unarmored. The mace was the way to go. And that was just nothing but a baseball bat with a heavy weight on the end of it. Sometimes yeah. it spikes. Just one blow anywhere to the body usually just take you out. Hit you in the elbow, take an arm out. Hit you in the back and just send you down. Hit you in the head, that was it. You're through. You just crushed you. And it would crush you even if you had plate armor on. Because it would just, but, it would just, you know, cram the armor in on you. You know, the, uh, every, you know, the movies are always showing you how awesome the sword was. The sword wasn't really all that good. It was more of a status symbol. What was good was things like the mace and the battle axe. I was just thinking while you were saying that, that it's like human heads are really so fragile. Blunt force trauma has stopping power. Considering how important the brain is. I mean, yeah, yeah, we have the skull and everything, and that's like cool. I mean, I'm glad that it's there, but... It seems like it's really not that. All you got to do is slip and fall on your yeah. fucking bathroom floor, and that shit's yeah. fucked up. You could get brain yeah. damage. And then that's some evolution. That's some bullshit evolution. If you do all the reading, and you, you know, go. If you do all the reading of what you know, the testimony from these killers, what they've said happened during certain homicides that they've committed, you can tell who has good experience and who doesn't. Guys that do things like grabbing hammers, okay, and hitting somebody in the head with a hammer. Not not really a good weapon. It gets stuck in the skull. It pops a hole in the skull and it gets stuck and it pulls and you have to hit him again. You want something big like a baseball bat. Or a club like and Captain then Caveman. They grab a knife and you, you, you'll, you'll hear, you know, the newspaper stabbed 37 times. Well, it took 37 stab wounds to kill the person. Knives aren't that good. Like I said, they this, don't have a stopping. Power. I have to say, this is one thing. And like, we're seriously, we're not murderers, and we're no. not we're not advocating anybody become murderers. This is something that has this bothers me in movies. I know there's like shit about guns that bothers you in movies. Yeah, this bothers me about knives. Somebody gets stabbed in the back, like in someone's like not even any major organs, and they yeah. immediately just fall over dead. Yeah, it doesn't happen that, that way. That does not happen like that. No. It just doesn't. One no. stab wound that's not going to kill no. you. Even if it did, it would take a long. Time. It takes a long time. There's you blood would pretty loss. much have to bleed out. You have to bleed, bleed out. You would have it to bleed out. It takes a long time. I mean, you know, like I said, it's like some of these people were stabbed like fucking a hundred times. They yeah. were stabbed a hundred times. Shot well, I've seen video of, of a girl being stabbed to death. This is over in Turkey. She was working behind the counter and they had the security camera on her. And she was having a, a you know, she was leaving her husband. Her husband came in there with a knife and uh, stabbed her to death. It took a long time. Now, you couldn't see all of it because... She fell down on the ground and tried to hide from him underneath the counter she was working well, behind. As you would. And you could hear her screaming, saying no. And he's, ooh, ooh, ooh. And he must have stabbed her 30 or 40 times. And then he ran out, and she was still alive. She ended up dying later. Well, like I said, I've written about some shit yeah. in my books where, I mean, where some women were stabbed, like, dozens and dozens of yeah. times. And it took them a really long time. Takes a long time. time to die from. Yeah. Shit. I was. I've seen some cases where like a woman was like shot in the face, and she yeah. still didn't die right away. It took like a month yeah. or two. And then a single blow to the head with a baseball bat just kill you. It, yeah. It, it, Most of the time. It or does or you, or you're out. You're down for the count. Yeah. You wake up days later in the hospital. 
Just, and that's know, just one blow. Pro tip for the zombie apocalypse. Yeah. Probably a baseball bat. Blunt force trauma. Always the Although way to go. Although kind of a long baseball bat, so you can hit them from way over there. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So they don't have to get too close. You don't want the bitey teeth There was a there. sword. Ja Japan. Nathan had the right idea. Japan had, Japan had a master swordsman, you know. Uh, it, it, oh, shit. Now, I've been running with Kuku Khan. I forgot his name. Um, shit. Kuku Khan will tell you. Yeah, yeah. Not, I was thinking. It was good. I was going to say. Musashi. Okay. He did uh, remember. Yeah, Musashi. Not bad. Now, Musashi, he took out a lot of guys with bladed weapons. Uh, but as he got went up in skill, he said, Ah, you know, sword's too easy. I'm just going to use a uh, a practice sword, which is a piece of wood. And he started killing guys with that. All right. Unbeknownst to the average person, though, a blow to the head with that, that practice sword, that piece of wood, had better stopping power than a damn sword. It would kill you. And then I think he figured that out. You don't have to cut somebody. Just a heavy blow to the head. You know what would have impressed then, me more? But it would scare everybody else because you're being killed by a dude with a practice sword. And then he said, you know what? Fuck that. I'm not even going to use a sword. You challenge... Because he didn't want... He didn't want to take these challenges. Everybody was challenging him to duels. He was sick of that shit. I can't go anywhere, He was guys. sick of that you shit. So what he would do is, is he would just say, okay, if you challenge me, I'm just going to kill you with a boat paddle. So he just started killing people with boat oars with a paddle. Imagine the dishonor. You know, these are samurai. Yeah, he was killed by a boat oar. Do you know it would be more so, rad if he killed that? people with a plastic spoon? They didn't have those, but <laughs> not enough mass. <laughs> okay, that's it. I'll, I'll, that would that would have impressed me, or like or like a fluffy, like something fluffy, like a little pillow. Yeah. Kill somebody with a pillow. You can put it over their face. You can smother. Musashi it. said that the that really what mattered when it came to to swords and 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 you know any kind of melee weapon was the length of the weapon. So he always made sure his sword was a few inches longer than everybody else's sword. Is that a, is that a dick euphemism? <laughs> no, it always had to do with reach. It had to do with reach. All right. He'd hold the sword in a way where you, the opponent couldn't really figure out how long his sword was. You know what I'm talking about? And he could... You're killing me. You're killing me. That's here. between girls. I'm talking to men. I'm not talking to women. He would hold the sword in a way facing you so, so the blade was going out in the back. You couldn't tell how long it was, so you couldn't judge how close you could get to him. And he'd go, pow, and he'd hit you with a sword on the top of the head and cleave your head. Or a stick. What are you going to do, man? Long, yeah, the, the, the better you reach, then, you know, the more of an Don't advantage Don't challenge that motherfucker. That's your fault. There was strategy involved with it. Like, you guys don't have anything better to do than walk around in ancient Japan, like, walking the little dirt roads. Hey, there's a guy. I'm going to challenge that guy to a fight to the death. Because they didn't have anything else to do. We're talking about Musashi now. So Musashi was basically an outlaw. Well, he, he was a lot of things. You know, he was a... Fugitive ex-con, ex-mercenary. They didn't have jobs. <laughs> he was a, no, he worked for people's armies. She's playing it as a joke. I'm just teasing you. Okay. I'm just teasing you. All right, I gotta go. All right, we're gonna, gotta this go. this show has gone on far too long. And yeah. We're just like going on. I'm out of here. On very. I'm out of here. Look at you. I'm he can't, here. he, he can't even, hungry. he you can't even find, uh, you, you, stay you, 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 until the end. He leaves me to do much. everything. I've been drinking. So have I. Shut that show down. Shut that show down. Shut that show down. Right okay, Tom says robot. we have to shut the show down now. Yep. Hope, hopefully you guys enjoy this. I know. It's like it's a, it's a horribly serious topic and we're just like being yeah. funny. But that's that's how we do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, if you like the show, remember to like, share, subscribe on all your social media. Share with all your friends, relatives, neighbors, people you don't like, whatever. Um, if you'd like to financially support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast, or go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account where you can make a one-time donation. If you'd like to do that, we would appreciate it very much. Um, also check out our Zazzle store at zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. We have lots of t-shirts and a tote bag that you can choose from. And our last video review, our last movie review rather was the evil dead. And also our last matinee which was like new movies that we saw in the theater uh episode two i just put up a couple of days ago so go check that out if you haven't already and that will do it for a uh -huh episode <laughs> that will do it for episode 114 we will see you next time for the halloween show bye